In this video, we explore the central and northern regions of Chile, starting in the capital city. Here we take in the sites of the metropolitan area and learn about its social and political complexities. From there, we head to a UNESCO World Heritage coastal city, one of the oldest colonial cities on the South American continent. We explore vibrant neighborhoods full of artistic flair on a guided tour. We head north along the coast to stunning beachside resort towns. And finish up in Chile's true wild west to a small tourist village located in the world's highest and driest desert. From here we explore the surreal lunar type landscapes of this magnificent place. Join us on this epic adventure into central and northern Chile. We continue from our previous series road tripping through the Patagonian region of southern Chile and Argentina. We've got a long driving day today, eight and a half hours from Lucan all the way up to a place called Melipilla, which is just about an hour outside of Santiago. We'll be staying there with our friend Diego, who we met on the Carretera Austral, which is pretty cool. And this will give us plenty of time tomorrow to clean the mystery machine and get it ready to go back to Santiago. So it's our last night here in the van. Um, we'll make sure to really appreciate our time. Last night is Scooby and Shaggy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we're here with Diego at the Chocolan Winery in the Chocolan Valley, just outside of the Maipo Valley. It's a very important watershed for the mountains to the ocean in central Chile, in metropolitan region. Exactly, and yeah. it goes right in, through Santiago area? Yeah, it's about one hour and a half distance to, to Santiago. In that direction, you can cross the, the Maipo River. Uh, this is a more important watershed uh, here. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. And the Maipo Valley is the most famous wine Maipo region Valley, yes. In Maipo. So it's the closest proximity si, si, closest, yes. to Santiago. Cool, cool. Well, we're actually going to head to Santiago today. We're about to drop off the mystery machine. So it's goodbye to the mystery machine and uh, we start the next part of our journey. Let's do it. Good. Safe journey. Eco ecotourism Patagonia. <laughs> yeah, ecotourism Patagonia. Ecotourism, ecotourism Melipilla. Now. <laughs> Melipilla. <laughs> So this is where we say farewell to the mystery machine. This has been our sweet ride for the last couple of weeks, two to three weeks. It's been a while now. We say goodbye in Santiago de Chile. All right, so we are in Santiago de Chile. This is our apartment. Look at this. What do you think, the chicky? Pretty nice. It is pretty nice, actually. Cool. We are here now in the capital city of Chile, Santiago, and today we plan on walking from the historic city center all the way to Cerro Santa Lucia, which is up on a hill and gets beautiful views of the city. Afterwards, we plan on going to lunch in the Bohemian suburb of Listaria and then go on a bike tour, which starts in Bella Vista and goes all throughout Santiago. So that should be pretty cool. And then later this evening, we'll be heading to dinner with Shane's dad's business partner, Carlos, and his wife. All right, what do you got there, Miranda? Yeah. So it's basically a sweet nectar drink with, I think that's uh, peach and, or nectarine, peach or nectarine, and it's got these wheat husks as well. What's it taste like? It's good? It tastes sweet. It's good. Very sweet. And it has cinnamon. <laughs> this is a local drink here in Chile. Good. <laughs> So 
So we're walking up now to Cerro Santa Lucia. We're gonna get a beautiful view of the town. We've got the Neptune fountains over here and it's just beautiful, the architecture around here. It's absolutely stunning, this area. From the top of the Cerro, or hill, we had an unsurpassed view of the Metropolitan Center. Here we plotted out the path to our next destination. So that was Cerro Santa Lucia or Santa Lucia Hill and the beautiful Castillo Castle Hidalgo on the top there. Fantastic views, 360 degree views of the city here and the beautiful Andes Mountains in the backdrop that were looking a little bit hazy. In fact, we went past a tour guide a little earlier who was saying that in August you can't even see the mountains at all and that's due to the smog and pollution. So I would say that's probably one of the biggest problems here with Santiago is the smog and pollution that they have in the city. And especially on a hot day today, like today when there's no wind blowing, it tends to really sort of accumulate in the valley here. But um, when you can see those mountains, they're absolutely stunning because they're right on the doorstep of Santiago, making it a great place for adventure activities in the summertime. If you head up to the mountains, there's mountain biking and hiking. In the winter times, you've got some great world-class ski resorts up there as well. We wandered to the Bohemian village of Bea Vista, where we were to take a cycling tour with La Bicicleta Verde, called Parks and Politics. On our tour, we learned in depth about the past and present social and political situation in Chile. We understand there are many sides to this story and can only portray what we have witnessed or been told. How's the ice cream? Delish. Delish? Uh, cocoa and Nutella. As foreigners to this country, we try our best to approach these sensitive issues with an impartial view. After hearing some of these stories, it's hard not to empathize with those who have suffered. So we're in Bea Vista. What do you think, Miranda? It's a beautiful little place. Look at all the greenery. We're really loving the suburb, actually. Bea Vista is really nice street art everywhere and cool little sort of uh, bohemian cafes and restaurants, bars, beers in bars. So we just did a tour with La Bicicleta Verde, and it was the politics and parks tour, which was quite an interesting topic. They're using the parks themselves as a bit of an analogy for the politics that surrounds Santiago and the disparity between the different regions. And obviously the uh, the metaphor is that the nicer area that you are in, the nicer the parks are. So he sort of described the differences between the parks and regions. But a lot of this disparity has led to a lot of what has become um, the instability here in Santiago, socially and politically. It's really happened since the 1970s, since the uh, dictatorship of Augustine Pinochet, who took over the government in a, in a coup d'etat military takeover, killing the president at the time. This pretty much started to accumulate over time. A lot of tensions within society here where a lot of People were feeling though, as though they were being left behind when it came to things like inflation and, and different sorts of fees. Two of the main topics that he brought up were water and also hospitals and medical systems that had become completely privatized and almost unaffordable for the average people. 
over time, a lot of these things built up. And in 1999, there was a huge eruption. No longer a lot of people here in society couldn't really take it. So it led to a lot of the big, massive protests that took place over several months and created a lot of instability in the area. Uh, at one stage, I think it was the 25th of October in 1999, there was a massive protest, 3 million people in the streets here. And for the very first time since the dictatorship that finished in 1990, the military was brought into the area. And this is where things started to escalate, where people started pushing back against the military and the military started escalating the way that they were actually handling the situation. There was a lot of violence and bloodshed and people died on the street. So there is still a lot of instability here and you can see a lot of the signs, a lot of the protests and a lot of the graffiti and artwork is very politically motivated, especially towards the police and the military. Here. So there is kind of a bit of an uneasy vibe here in uh, Santiago at the time. Uh, he also mentioned as well that the protest we saw earlier was actually a, a right-wing protest for pushing for further powers and money for the police for them to be able to get more weapons and things like that. So it's kind of like a su obsessive subject on both sides, I suppose. We also get the frustration of people wanting security to return to a place that was once deemed the safest city in South America. There are many valid viewpoints in such a complicated situation, one which we can barely scratch the surface of. We do apologize if this retelling has either simplified the personal experiences of anyone affected or offended anyone in any way. This is not our intent. This subject is further elaborated for us when we reach the coastal town of Valparaíso. So we're at a local Hare Krishna place here in Valparaíso, eating some vegan lasagna. How is it? It's really good. <laughs> yeah. Everything's very flavorful here. Mm, very good. And very relaxing. It's the life of a Hare Krishna up there. exploring the UNESCO World Heritage City of Valparaiso and we have a walking tour book this morning and we may opt to do another one this afternoon. We just want to further understand the complexity of one of Chile's oldest cities. And then later on tonight we're heading on a night bus up north to La Serena which sits on Chile's northern coast. So behind me here we have the tallest and largest mural in Chile and it's 74 meters high. It's part of a collection of four murals that represent the different seasons. This one here represents the summer. Well, this is the first funicular of Valparaiso. It is related to the rich people because they wanted to make a funicular here in this side. And well, they paid for themselves. They built a funicular, okay? So this was the first, built in 1883, and we're going to see it later on the top side, yeah? And, well, these ones, the same as other seven, are still working in Valparaiso, and they move people daily. Yeah, it's like more than a tourist attraction, it's actually a transport for the people, for the porteño, which we are. Uh -huh. In this place there used to be a lot of business, including the customs, yeah? So this place used to be called the customs square. And nowadays it's the Plaza Sotomayor, or Sotomayor Square, because there was, um, in the conflict of the Pacific, yeah, I, I don't know if you heard about it, but in the conflict of the Pacific there was this uh, minister of war called Rafael Sotomayor, and he died with a, of a stroke of the, in the brain, and after that they called this place Sotomayor Square, right? Well, this is the... Second of the of the elevators, but they are not elevators; they are funiculars. But we say uh, ascensor, or for the Portuguese, we say ascensor because in the French language, ascensor goes up, and that is why it's called ascensor for us. But it's actually a funicular. It's a 60 meters long of funicular, and well, it was built in 1886, but it got burned, and in 1994 was reinaugurated. Mm -hmm. 
So we're on the second oldest hill here in Valparaiso called Cerro Corriera. Yeah. And it uh, used to be the place for where the workers for the port were stationed. So behind me here we have the first hill settled in the area which was in 1536 when the Spanish first settled this region around here to be the basis of what is now Santiago. And that hill up there is called Santo Domingo. The first church that was established down here was the Iglesia de la Matriz. That one down there is actually the fourth iteration of that church, mainly due to things like earthquakes and uh, tsunamis that have come through the area here. And actually, Fa Francis Drake, when he came through here on his voyage, uh, actually raided this church and burnt down part of the city. So it's the fourth iteration. A lot of the buildings around here, in fact, are kind of recent, at least from the last hundred years or so, because of the massive earthquake they had here in 1906. So they've had many major earthquakes in this city's history, Chile being the most seismically active country in the world. On Cerro Alegre, and uh, this is the the wealthier side, right? This was yeah. where the wor the workers' bosses were. But in the old days, right? In the old uh, days. Nowadays, uh, the city has changed to that. There's no like rich class or poor class in the same place. All the people is like Makes the same class. Ah, right? spread out. Ah. And I can say because when you went, if you went to Santiago, for example, yeah. you see that there's a whole difference between Vitacura and well, Maipú, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And it changes a lot. This place, being uh, Valparaiso, has not uh, of that. Okay. So it's uh, like a whole mixture. It's a mixture. Okay. All classes within one exactly. region. Exactly. And that, that is why I like it because yeah. uh, all the people are the same. You may say. There are how many hills were there? Forty. Forty-two. Forty-two hills, yeah. and each one was its own little sort of thing. Identity. Identity. Yeah. That's cool. This mural here actually talks about the, the rights of the cyclists because a lot of them have died cycling a lot of these roads here. There are no actual cycle trails, so you find like a lot of political and social messages in some of the murals. Our guide Matthias took us through to areas with some of the most impressive street art we had ever come across. As far as urban places go, Valparaiso is a culturally enriching destination for any itinerary to Chile. of 2019 it begins with the indigenous tribes here uh, for example those are mapuche mm -hmm. but they like this one also but that, those ones are patagonians like the onas uh, yeah. etc it's cyclic you may say because in the old days the the mapuche used to fight along as, against the the spanish <laughs> but now these they are fighting against the cops of the chilean uh, government uh -huh. they, are, they are they are always fighting because there's a huge debt they want their old territories back but i would say that uh, they we should do like the united states do with the, um, reserv the reservations of the tribes uh, yeah uh, like the sioux for example they have their own territories this uh, mural is from 2019 in the riots so they are actually the the people is fighting against the cops right so that is what about and i would say the facts like the straight fact 
there was a lot of riots. The, the people started to evade the metro and the cops started to uh, take under arrest all those people that started to make the, the evasions in the metro. Afterwards, the people started to get mad about it and the cops, um, well, they were like uh, really angry with it. So they started to shoot people. The people started to loot some places. It was all uh, madness all over the Chile in those days. So, so escalation. Yeah, 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 it escalated really quickly. In, and in one day, the, um, after the riots, the president take, took out the military. It's since the, it's the first time since the, the dictatorship. So it was like a really hard time for me. I was actually on the streets in those days. I actually got shot twice. <laughs> I joined the, run, the, the Red Cross in those days and I was helping people. And the cops shoot me anyway. Yeah. And you were working for the Red Cross and the cops yeah. shot you? Yeah, I had a lot of people. In those days, uh, the cops started to shoot to the face of the people. Mm. So that is why this woman has uh, lost her, her eyes. We've seen a lot of the graffiti of the bleeding eyes everywhere. That is why. Yeah. That is why. Because yeah. the cops, uh, intentionally, they started to shoot the people. Yeah. In this place, there's a lot of big houses. So, uh, big houses it's for rich people, and the rich people made their first funicular in here for them, right? It's like um, bragging about their money. That was in 1883, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. And the other one is in 1886, and those are for the workers, right? So, you can see here some classic German style architecture, along with some of the Victorian architecture in the area as well. And it just shows that this area was first inhabited by the Germans and the British here at the same time. So we're at Forno, which is one of the top restaurants here in Valparaiso. Now, I've got myself a pisco sour, something that they make here themselves, and there is actually a little bit of a rivalry between Peru and Chile to, as to who has the best pisco sour, so I'll be the judge. Oh, that is magical, but we're gonna do a little while until we get to Peru, so maybe I'll have to judge afterwards. Mm -hmm. How's your water? Fresh. Watery, delicious. Got that Lutheran church in the background there. Absolutely stunning. This was recommended by our guide, Matthias, as well. He said this is a great place. Beautiful views. Looking forward to the food. Oh my god, we are in ceviche heaven, Miranda. Look at that. <laughs> Let's get into it. Provecho. Con un Chocolate and brownie. Oh, the pie de limon. Mochachino. So if you ever wanted to know what the uh, the premium coaches are like here in Chile, they're actually quite nice. This is uh, the Kama seat and this the is salon with- Salon Kama. Salon Kama, sorry. This is with uh, Condor, is that right? Yeah. And we'll be uh, traveling to La Serena, which is about six and a half hours from uh, Valdeparaiso. So we're just gonna chill out here and relax. Luxury, business class. <laughs> We 
started early with a trip to the Kakimbo shopping mall to gather some essentials. We decided to take the long way back by walking approximately 15 kilometers to our hotel in La Serena by the coast. So we're here in Coquimbo. We stayed last night in La Serena and this is the neighboring town. We're actually just walking along the Avenida Costanera, so the coastal avenue here uh, along Playa Coquimbo. In the background here, I found something really interesting. There is a mosque that sits up on the hill up there, or at least it's an Islamic cultural center there, funded by Morocco, actually. So it's that Moroccan-style tower up there that's actually a, a replica of one in Marrakesh. So it's the Mohammed VI, or the Centro Mohammed VI, that sits up there. I've never seen anything like that in South America. There's not a whole lot of Islamic influence, obviously. This is a, a predominantly Catholic continent down here in South America. So I found that pretty interesting to see. So we're gonna walk up to a place called Pueblito right now. So Pueblito is a, a little village or center, or at least that's what it means. I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna come across there. Everybody said we have to check it out and didn't elaborate too much on why. I think there's some nice restaurants and bars and uh, I think even a, a resort sort of type feel. So we're gonna go up there and check it out for a bit and then we'll walk all the way back to La Serena. So we noticed something really interesting along the beaches here. There are people harvesting the seaweed and I just did a little quick Google search as to why because I was really curious. Apparently it's free to access for everyone. So anyone can harvest seaweed or kelp from the beaches here. And one of the reasons why they do that is for cultivated abalone. So they do it to feed the abalone essentially in cultivated farms. So maybe that's an industry around here. I'm not sure, I assume so. Chicky. He's got ceviche with shrimp and avocado and it looks like some bell pepper. So they call it ceviche con camarones y palta. And uh, we are in, what was the name of this place again? Pueblitos. 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 yeah. That's it. In Coquimbo. Yeah. All right. Get into it. Buen provecho. We've been doing like a whole bunch of food <laughs> reviews lately. We should do a food blog. Yeah, this is insane. Look at that fried fish. This, I. Yeah, your sandwich is. I know. <laughs> So we just spent a couple of hours relaxing here at the Ovo Beach Bar and we are now heading back to La Serena along the beach. It's a beautiful time of the day, golden hour almost, the sun is starting to go down. Tonight we're doing the overnight bus up to San Pedro de Atacama. It's a 16 and a half or 17 hours bus ride because we have to do a changeover in Kalama. So it's going to take us a little while to get up there, but hopefully we get a decent nap. The buses here are quite luxurious. They are uh, Salon Karma, which is kind of like a business class. It lies right back and really nice and comfortable. So hopefully we get a decent night's sleep there. I forgot to mention it's Easter here, so it's almost like a completely different place to what we saw this morning with the sea fog rolling through and I'm assuming that a lot of the uh, predominantly Catholic population was at Mass and now the sun's out and everyone's just enjoying their uh, the Easter weekend away. Most likely we have a lot of people coming up from Santiago and other places here just enjoying the beachside. It's really nice, nice atmosphere here. Really, been really beautiful. We've just arrived in La Serena. We've been walking for quite a while. We were comparing the walk, as I mentioned before, in Los Angeles, but it kind of feels like going from Venice Beach, which is kind of like the grungier end right down there, uh, to this end here, which is kind of a bit more like Santa Monica. It's a little upper class and nicer, but um, it's it's been a really nice walk along the uh, the Costanera, the Avenida. 
haven't got long for sunset either, so we might even stick around just for a little bit to catch a glimpse of that sunset. Our long 16-hour bus ride stopping in Antofagasta and changing buses in the town of La Calama, we finally arrived into San Pedro de Atacama in the afternoon, giving us enough time for a small rest before heading out on our stargazing activity which included wine and snacks. San Pedro de Atacama is one of the best places on earth for stargazing. This is why the internationally funded ALMA facility nearby hosts the world's largest ground-based facility for astronomical observations. We arrived yesterday here in San Pedro de Atacama, nestled in the highest and driest desert in the world, the Atacama Desert. Because it's such a high and dry place at 3,200 meters, there is little atmosphere and also little precipitation, making it one of the best places in the world for stargazing. And that's exactly what we did last night with Atacama Tours. Now today what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time roaming around the beautiful little Pueblito or Pueblo, small village here in San Pedro de Atacama. It's a really beautiful village. I visited here myself back in 2014. And then we're going to go check out a geological feature known as Valle de la Luna, the Valley of the Moon. And that's called that because of the moon-like landscape that we'll see when we get there. Right now we're wandering down the main street here in San Pedro de Atacama. It's called Caracoles, which literally translates as snails. But uh, this street here has these beautiful adobe sort of mud bricked houses and shops around here. Uh, selling everything from tours, souvenirs and foods, all that sort of stuff. So it's very much a tourist town, but it is really, really beautiful. It kind of feels like the old wild west a little bit here. How are the uh, empanadas? Mine were delicious. <laughs> and the frutilla. <laughs> it's good that we're showing you these things at the end. And half of whatever this sweet thing is that the guy sold in the <laughs> truck. <laughs> it's good. Just eating the local treats. The original inhabitants of the area, the Atacameños, settled a nearby desert oasis in around 500 AD and were later conquered by the Inca Empire at the start of the 15th century. San Pedro de Atacama was part of Bolivia until claimed by Chile after the War of the Pacific in 1884. After exploring the town, we made our way out to the desert on a guided tour with Wipala expedition to Valle de la Luna, the Valley of the Moon. So I'm in the Atacama Desert in the Antofagasta region of northern Chile. Behind me here you can see 19 active volcanoes that are pretty much produced by the collision of two tectonic plates here, forming two mountain ranges, the coastal mountain range and the Andes mountain range in the background there. 
So it's a very, very active region of the country, but sitting between those two mountain ranges is this desert. And as I mentioned before, because of the mountain ranges themselves, it blocks off all the weather conditions that come from the ocean. So it is not only the highest desert in the world, but it's also the driest desert in the world. We're about to go to Valle de la Luna, which is the Valley of the Moon, and we'll check out this crazy otherworldly landscape that uh, exists in this area. So we can see down here the Teatro or, or the Theatre, also known as the Crater. And that's because of all these crater-like structures that they have here in the ground, which is why it gives the region the name the Valle de la Luna or the Valley of the Moon. When the rain comes and it's really only about 25 mils per year, like I said, driest part of the world, it bring, washes down all of the minerals to the, the basin or the bottom of the valley there and then Pretty much within a day, it is completely evaporated and what's remaining is the salt that stays on top and gives it that crusty white colored surface, only really adding to the effect, looking like a moonscape here. So we're about to go down and check out some more places in the Valley de la Luna. So the original indigenous name for the structures behind me was Ashasas, which meant the old people. A uh, priest came through here, a Spanish priest, and he named the area the Tres Marias after the Virgin Mary. Uh, supposedly one looks like it's kneeling down, another one looks like it's holding up a baby, and then the other one looks like it's praying, apparently. And then this other structure on the side there they call Pac-Man or T-Rex, which kind of looks like both, so interesting. Oh, and it's all formed through erosion. The wind comes down from the Pacific Ocean over the uh, Jamaica Mountains over behind me here, and it pretty much erodes through this landscape. So this area here is an old mine for uh, mining salt and the reason why they did that it was before electricity. This is how they kept their meat preserved. Now, apparently this area here was used in advertising for Louis Vuitton and the area we went to before where the big sand dunes were, the sand dune or the duno mejor, is uh, where they shot some scenes from the Mandalorian. From the valley floor, we headed up to the surrounding high cliffs in preparation for an astonishing desert sunset. Perfect way to spend our last night in Chile. Okay, so I'm making this video here in San Pedro de Atacama in preparation for the next couple of days, particularly for tomorrow because we have to get up really early. We've got a 6.30am pickup here and we're crossing the border into Bolivia. 
We're making our way up to Salar di Ayuni, which is the Ayuni Salt Flats. And along the way, we'll be stopping off at some beautiful geothermal lakes and volcanic sites. There's flamingos everywhere. I did this myself back in 2014, so I have a bit of an idea of what to expect, but we'll be doing it over a three-day period, so two nights, three days. And um, we are actually climbing up in altitudes. We will be making our way up over the next two days to 3,600 meters. So we're making a little bit of an increase over the next few days. And this is where we may actually feel the altitude sickness. So looking forward to the next couple of days, but also we're a little bit nervous. Follow us for this epic adventure into the Bolivian Altiplano coming soon. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel and become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family, or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks, guys. So this is just beautiful up here. What do you think? Look at the puppy. Sorry. <laughs> I can. It's Miranda so is obsessed with all the dogs in this country.